prepped here for a weird things podcast thank you to justin for the raid if you're new stick around this is a good show uh, there's there's the j-man now hello friends hey man how's it going oh going good going good having a good time today good it's always good to have uh, a good time yeah I like to think so My mom tried to hug me (laughs) How dare she? It was fucked up I'm sorry I cursed I forgot Mm -hmm. what what podcast we're on Uh, Affection It's the worst Brian Well um, Affection and I, and I, I Back away saying Mom You don't understand. HQ is like Grand Central Station right now. We have so many people coming and going. And she's like, well, just give me a hug. And I'm like, I will not do this, Mom. (laughs) I cannot in good conscience do this. And uh, uh, Man, that was a Where was COVID-19 during my teenage years? I couldn't (laughs) use that excuse. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, I know for, particularly for older people, you know, it's like, like, I mean, I, I talk to my parents on a regular basis. I'm sure you do and all that. You know, a lot of times, so for people like that, isolation is just, you know. Well, they, they've been good and they're good when they go out. Um, but um, uh, I, 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 I don't know. She just, I, 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 maybe the novelty is fading off. And, and but, but it's like, she's 70. And it's like, the odds of surviving COVID at 70 you have you have better odds of surviving climbing Mount Everest. That is an actuarial fact, and so, um, uh, and, and she's and 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 I'm just like uh, and I'm like no, no no you don't understand there's so many people you, I can't you're like no just give me a hug or whatever and then and then I went and I put on a mask afterwards. And my mom and dad were mocking me, going like, you know, like I'm answering questions, and they're like, burr, 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 burr. and I'm just like, you know, like, and I'm like, uh, and they're like, look, you all got, we all got to go sometime. And I said, mom, dad, that's the point. I know a hundred percent for a fact that you both are going to die. What I'm asking, you know, and, and after you die, 
after you die, it would be a kindness to me if I didn't have to spend the rest of hmm. my days worrying <laughs> about whether or not I uh, had a I hand in it. I am not getting audio, <laughs> Bryce. And so, and so, and then I, so I recontextualized and I said, right now, me sitting far away wearing this mask, you are doing hmm. me a kindness so that for the rest of my life, I'm never going to have to wonder if it was in any way my fault. I hear you. I hear you. I, I still, Brian, denying your mom a hug. Oh, oh my God. Oh, <laughs> oh man. I got it. Uh, Justin, you can hear. Can you hear us? Oh, his, his things are not in. Well, that's why he's not here. Oh, wait, he, he, not he had uh, he had other <coughs> headphones on. Uh, yeah, didn't seem. Yeah, but, but these. I'm an, I'm an idiot. It's a headphone oh, thing. Okay. okay. Cool. I'm an idiot. Hey, Justin. So you missed the story. Uh, My mom okay. tried to give me a uh, hug. <laughs> WTF. Okay. Moms. Moms. Ah, oh, the worst. That's why I live across the country. I just can't stand them. <laughs> I'm like, uh, you know, arm's length. No, not enough for, for my, my mom dislike. I'm just like, what's an entire country's worth. <laughs> you stay on one coast, There's I like, stay on the other. The ease at which you and I were able to both move cross country. It was made easier because having siblings that got married and had kids. Oh, <laughs> oh just God, feel yeah. less guilt. You're, you're yeah. just like, both moms are like, uh, have a good time storming the castle. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. My my mom, you know, describes l <laughs> her relationship to her grandchildren uh, as crack. She's like, like they're like crack for like I I just I, I I pick them up and I enjoy spending time with them and all I wonder is when I can spend the next moment of time with them and I'm like, that's a lot of you not worrying about where I am. So I'm just gonna be yeah. over yeah. here. <laughs> They're grandkids. They get you really high. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Hey, everybody. I'm going to start weird things here in just a moment. So I think uh, COVID hair related news. Um, uh, every other day, that's uh, 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 at this length, that's how often uh, uh, you need to shampoo. Is Because uh, 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 like yesterday, everything's real dry, real, real, you know, hair sprayed in. Wake up today, I look in the mirror, guy is freaking Baltar, I swear to God. Just perfect volume, just swoop. It's gonna change when it gets too long, but every other day is 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 the way to go to wash hair. I I I put on hats when I podcast. Other than that, there's no hat, and I'm sideshow Bob. I mean, look at I mean, look at this. Come on, hey, it's nice. It's nice. Hey, come on, it's nice. I I got these curls. I just can't like control. I'm like literally the bozo of the cloud. Here. I never like... ever in a million years thought I would dig having the feathered curls because it was it was cliche and trite. Like you. What whatever is in in third grade, you grow to you know, you hate by middle school, and then you continue to hate it for decades to come, uh, mm -hmm. and then it feels novel, and uh, that's what I'm experiencing with the the little ducktails at the end. I mean, like we're like like if you if we were in a van and time traveled to the 1970s, we would blend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you and I. I mean. Uh, uh, problematic orange uh, carb uh, aside, <laughs> you and I could could step right into a couple of roles uh, popular in the early eighties. Right. And then George Lucas over here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. I think. Do you hear those here? rumors uh, about him taking over and making three more movies? <laughs> What? Wait, Do you have a sequel a... to Empire Strikes yeah, Back? Yeah. No, that that's the that's the latest rumors. I mean, with 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 the demonization of Kathleen Kennedy and the oustering of her. Is this if it comes from cosmic 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 book news? No, it's it's, like... it's one particular guy who's had he he's lately he's been the Nate Silver of uh, of Lucasfilm Disney leaks and uh, and he said that uh, there's talks about George Lucas. Res e either at the very least resuming taking over all of Lucasfilm or possibly making three new movies. 
Yeah, Cos- well, co- one of the sources, the Cosmic News has been putting this out for a couple of years. They've had a hate for Kathleen Kennedy and they keep sort of saying the same thing. Um, I don't... <laughs> what about George Lucas at this point in his life makes you think he's anxious to go back and make more movies? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Also, especially the movies that those that Star Wars movies have to be now, like they are, yeah. you know, he's not going to have final say on them. He's going to have to go out and do a big press tour that he doesn't want to do. Like he's, yeah. <laughs> I, oh, sign up for another lifetime of everyone saying I ruined my own franchise. That sounds yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I will say, I will say that. Him doing a thing on Disney Plus, I think, would make sense if if he if they wanted him to do whatever Star Wars stories like, if, and that would seem like he can put those out, just drop them on a midnight, and people would be excited about them, and he wouldn't have to do a ton of press for it. Yeah, uh, some said they are going to do more Willow. By the way, uh, I think I I put my money. I mean, I think that I think bringing him into the process more would probably be a good idea because if one of the one of the criticisms I would say that you could really hold up about the, the last three movies with well, the biggest criticism other than individual directorial choices is the lack of narrative direction. It was three different, you know, it felt it like was, three different yeah. people, it, although two it, directors. It was, it yeah. was, it was like uh, when Michael Scott works with the improv troupe, <laughs> it was like somebody yeah. starts to build a story and somebody jumps in and you're like, this is the FBI. <laughs> and but then, but then like Abrams even goes and changes his own sort of, he like the setup, was like yeah. it's like i it was kind of like ah oh, they changed I'm like i don't know you, you you did a very abram thing and put a lot of things near nobody's able to land you know and then not even you um they've got right now between favreau you know favreau what he did with mandalorian and that you know the rogues gallery you put together of different directors and talent coming in there and you look at favreau's batting record now with with disney oh, between with what he did and... watching yeah yeah, but and, and like you know, Favreau, you look at you start looking at remember Jungle Book, all these billion dollar movies he's been doing for them. And it's he's like, right, that's I think that's the guy, you know, and, and yeah. loyalty, like this is a guy that goes off and does, you know, directs billion dollar movies and comes back and plays Happy Hogan. Yeah, you know, I, I, for I, I, small I, I, roles. Oh, you stole my joke. I was gonna be like, Yeah, yeah, don't overplay it. This is a guy that protects Iron Man. <laughs> this yeah. is the guy that he's just Tony Stark's bodyguard for crying well, no, out loud. And then, What's the and then he deal? like he like shoots his own cooking web series. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he Basically, just does he, that while he's like all directing or starring in these movies. It's like a TV version of uh the movie was it Chef? Was that the movie? What was the name of the yeah. movie he did where Chef. Yeah. yeah. Chef. God, yeah. that, that, that movie was delightful. Uh, it, 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 uh, it, okay, all right, we can start the show. Oh, yeah, right. sorry. Um, we uh, can start the show. Uh, you guys good? Yeah. Yep. yep. All right, I'm going to count you in, Andrew. Mm-hmm. And three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello, friends. Brian Brushwood. Yo. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. Splashdown! Do you Man. feel it? Do you feel it, everybody? Yeah, you know what? I feel it because uh, I feel my jealousy of not having a boat to be one of the gawkers <laughs> that made a beeline <laughs> to just sit there and watch all of it unfold. How he was the Coachella of space missions. It was unreal. Uh, Wait, oh, don't know what? or listen to this oh, in the far future. Oh, oh Bryce uh, doesn't know oh, about oh, this. I know. Yeah, I yeah. missed all this. So about 63 days ago or so, uh, NASA and SpaceX sent the Crew Dragon capsule up to the International Space Station with Bob and Doug, you know, not not the Canadian duo, the American astronaut duo, sent them to the International Space Station. And then yesterday, they splashed down. They returned from their mission to the International Space Station off the coast of Pensacola, middle of the ocean, but not that far in the middle of the ocean. Uh, there to greet them was uh, NASA crews, SpaceX crews, the Coast Guard. And a lot of people in boats because it's Florida. <laughs> uh, there's yeah. a reason they call that the Redneck Riviera. Riviera. I mean, it's. Uh, yep. uh, it was uh, <laughs> the official NASA. That's response. a lot of boats. I know. That's not all rescue boats. That's a lot of fools out there. <laughs> do, do, dudes on jet skis. Um, uh, NASA's official response included the phrase, we need to do better. <laughs> well, and. 
So here's so here's the thing. The part of the reason is the danger is that uh, one of the things the fuels they use on board is these what are called hypergolics. Remember when they had they tested the last one on the stand and it blew up like yep. very very you know that's the hypergolic. It's a super yeah yeah very incredibly powerful fuel. It takes you know just it it, it ignites super fast. It's one of the things you use for the escape rockets, etc. So when the thing lands, that's the thing you're worried about. It's also the fumes are extremely toxic. One of the worst on the ground disasters ever was like a Soviet rocket killed like 70 people when like the upper stages blew up, not counting the hundreds of others that got it. You know, the, the fumes and stuff affected them. They were they say they were in the safe margin, but it's one of these things you don't want a bunch of big power boats and stuff and people driving around. <laughs> and this is just <laughs> <laughs> these pictures it's just i mean yeah. i've i have long said that the state motto for florida in my heart is sorry for party rocking and nothing <laughs> uh, uh nothing typifies it more than just like this momentous occasion in uh, quite possibly a first step of space co colonization in a way that we have never seen before and it's just like randos with like you know bud light uh, uh coolers just bud like seltzer <laughs> yes i please! i joked i i joked and i'm sure i heard it somewhere else is like you know the crew should have like the, the the ground crew should have been wearing like eight masks when they opened up the door to greet them <laughs> this is a pretty close second this is a pretty close second oh my god oh my god it's just it, you know that we, we, the only thing that would have made it more Florida is if they would have tossed both Bob and Doug each their own beers to shotgun as their first uh, <laughs> acts, having repatriated to Earth. Oh, I yeah. Mean, I, I, I just imagine... <laughs> I just imagine smash cut to the NASA meeting and in the background, whatever they're saying in the background, you just see a circle around Florida with the word no in red. <laughs> Uh, or, or either that or they make the announcement tomorrow that they're going to go straight to vertical landings <laughs> with the capsule yeah. Yeah. on land. Although I do so, love that it, 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 it's that uh, uh, image, Brian, that that made you turn into the cat meme with the newspaper of like, I should buy a boat. <laughs> you know, that's 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 what made it's like I never really saw the worth in a boat until I watched a bunch of ding dongs uh, ringing the uh, the splashdown of a private dragon uh, space so, flight. Somebody had a MAGA flag. <laughs> Trump so flag, yeah. Yeah, that's hilarious. All right, sorry, I cut you off, Andrew. Oh, yeah. Well, so uh, if you watch the press conference yesterday, you could see uh, Jim Bridenstine being very kind of the diplomatic, we need to do better, we need to do better. Um, there's another agency, <laughs> you know, that's in, you know, there's a department that is uh, in charge of that out there, and that would be the Coast Guard. And so um, I don't know. I don't think anybody expected quite this sort of reaction, but it's sort of like, uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to point any fingers and stuff, but the job of stopping people, and there's also it's international waters, so that it's a quasi kind of hey, I can do whatever I want, but there is leeway to say, hey, uh, this is a danger zone. There's this whatever, and Coast Guard can board anybody with an American flag out in there, whatever. So I we're guess, probably going to see a lot more Coast Guard ships out there next time. Well, if yes. it's international waters, though, then that becomes problematic because you could militarize it and actually send out the Navy, but then you turn it into. It has the stink of a military operation on it, which which I'm sure NASA, all uh, things considered, yeah. would like to avoid. I, I, I think yeah, this is so a Coast Guard thing. It's like you're just making sure that you ID the boats that are out there and they know that they're that they need to stay in a certain area. And then, you know, you can you can really punish people like ultimately like those guys aren't in cigarette boats that are going to take off to Cuba or whatever. Right. Yeah, like they're yeah. just like weekend warriors that that you can really. Put yeah. A and and again. You know, again, like we said, out there, international waters, it's it is it's not as clear as you can't go here. But if they got an American flag, the Coast Guard can. So there is that kind of like, like yeah, you can't really say you got to get out of here, but they can also say, hey, uh, leave or you will be boarded. <laughs> you know, yeah. which yeah. you know we we'll get into that. Um, but this is this is a problem that you know we haven't done a splashdown in forty some years. You yeah. know, it is just it's just it's it's holy a holy cow! I didn't think about that because uh uh we had the space shuttle which w landed on land and then and then we were using the soyuz which just you know just kind of soft hard crash landed on land <laughs> um, yeah 
Wow. I mean, we do we do splashdowns with. I mean, we've done with uncrewed. We've sure. done like you know the, the 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 dragons have done that, and then we've had, uh, you know, the uh, first stages have have done that. But yeah, as far as a crew, like yeah, and so that's you know uh, very interesting. Well, and you know, keep, um, keep in mind, of course, we've talked about this before, but um, it may feel like a step into the past to go back to splashdown technology. Uh, it's a proven way to safely land a capsule. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And until we uh, have as high of confidence of being able to launch into space through, uh, you know, the SpaceX program, then, uh, then we could start trying to land it, you know, uh, Buck Rogers style, but uh, uh, it'll be a while. We're going to be in splashdown for, for a bit of testing. <laughs> But by, by the way, uh, I just did some some uh, quick Googling on trends in boat ownership over the past several decades. And we are indeed at a, pardon the pun, high watermark for <laughs> boats, uh, including the number one state for recreational boating activity, measuring $23.3 billion of economic activity in 2018, the state of Florida. <laughs> Man, well, that's, yeah. that, I mean, that's that's pre COVID, man. Uh, I mean, uh, if in a world where sometimes you just want like, like, like my neighbors across the street just bought a boat and I'm certain because there's just, you know, you, you, you get the cabin fever and it's like, wouldn't it be great to just go <laughs> and yeah. be and, and, make, and yeah, be make sure there? that your social bubble is indeed the only bubble the, the that ocean. you are. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and for people who aren't familiar with like Florida, like I lived, I lived in a, lived in the town of plantation, which <laughs> Justin, I both went to school there. Uh, they, we lived, we were eight miles, four miles inland four or five miles inland. I would say we had a canal in our backyard that had ocean access. So we would, from our backyard, we could hop on a boat and there were thousands of canals like that in Florida. So it's not just like, and so you didn't have to go drive your boat, you know, to a no. jetty. You just went to your backyard, got your boat, drove down the canals for a few miles and stuff. And you're out in the ocean and that's, that's Florida. It's kind of makes it awesome yeah. and scary. And you can read more about that in my book, The Girl Beneath the Sea, which is set hey. in Florida hey. and boating culture. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that, yeah, it, it, it is one of the things I think it was hard for them to imagine that this many people would sort of show up or people would be that stupid and get close. But hey, people. I mean, okay, look. Looks over left shoulder, looks over right shoulder. You tell me the three of us happen to be on a boat and then we get the news, we get the coordinates. You tell me we're not going to take a little 10 mile journey, take, take a little pixie loo. <laughs> I mean, I would stay out. I would stay outside the zone where the Coast Guard had said, "Please stay out of." Yes, yes. Yeah. I think a hundred, a hundred percent. We are, we are going as close as we feel like we want to get eyes on it, and and I don't know if we would venture much further beyond that. But as long as we could see something falling out of the sky, I don't know, we would guys. Be happy. The GPS is working, but I don't have internet. So I'm trying to look up what the safe distance is that they want us to stay. I mean, let's just, you know, <laughs> kind of stay what feels right far away. Uh... Yeah. Uh, so lost in all this, though, is the fact that, hey, holy crap, a private company was able to take astronauts to the National Space Station and return them back to Earth safely. And wasn't really a competition, but certainly was a two. Uh, there was a bit of a race between SpaceX and Boeing. Boeing has the Starliner program. And when this was first announced, it got a lot of attention because that Boeing was able to get the contract for $4.2 billion. SpaceX got it for $2.6 billion, which one of those numbers is a lot bigger than the other one. Boeing was made, you know, almost nearly $2 billion more to the, go to build the Starliner. The the Boeing is like the tiny space shuttle one, right? The, uh, the, no, the, that's no, no, that no, the, that's, that's the Sierra Nevada. Or, oh, OK, no. Yeah, no, the Boeing is a Starliner. It's another large capsule looking thing. Got it. Okay. And that was the one that had. They did a a they had a couple problems initially. Both Boeing and SpaceX were going through a lot of parachute development issues, trying to make them work. You know, Boeing did one of the tests where one of the parachutes didn't deploy or wasn't it, the parachutes weren't attached. Like, oh, that's just a minor problem. Like, eh, kind of a big problem. 
they were trying to do their last test mission was unmanned. It was supposed to go up and intercept on a do an intercept course with the International Space Station. But there was a software malfunction, so they avoided doing that, and they were able to reenter it and bring it back. And then they found out there was another software problem that could have been catastrophic had there been crew on board. And Boeing was like, "Yeah, hey, we can put a patch for that." And NASA's like, "You know," and they publicly said, NASA said, "You know, we spent a lot of attention on SpaceX because their pathway is unconventional to us. It's different than what we're doing." And they, you have to read through the lines. Like, we probably should have spent some more time working with Boeing. Oh, and, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so it may be that that Boeing was um, the the less fun child to play with and got less uh, uh, got less correction. I, I, yeah, more like well, it's Boeing. They're fine. You know, Boeing is yeah. fine. Boeing is is fine. It was that kind of mentality. SpaceX, and again, uh, you listen to the relationship between NASA talks about SpaceX, and it is extremely complimentary. NASA has an incredible amount of experience and knowledge, et cetera. From, you know, being, you know, just, you know, pioneers in this, you know, as far as, you know, building different kinds of craft, et cetera, and what to do. A young company like SpaceX, which is willing to say, hey, we're going to innovate fast, move quickly. You work with a company, you work with organizations like NASA. It's a, it is great. I think it's a great sort of thing where you have people say, hey, we'll build a thing. We'll make it work. If it doesn't, we're going to talk to you and you're going to help us understand why. Boeing is sort of like, well, we know what we're doing, but also like we hear Boeing, but it's like, you know, it's a name, it's a label, it's a label now. And does it yeah, mean, yeah. you know, it doesn't necessarily mean, uh, uh, you know, that it's the height of, uh, the kind of innovation that has made Boeing the company that it is. It also is like these, these defense contractors that are literally the military industrial complex, you hire them because you don't want to deal with them a lot, right? Like they, you just say, Give us the thing. Like, that's the point of a Boeing. That's the point of a Northrop Grumman. That's the point of a Lockheed Martin. Right. And uh, uh, yeah. if you have a conversation, uh, uh, the conversation is always, how's it going? Answer, great. Um, do you need more money? And they say either not yet or yes, a lot. And that's the conversation. And then you yeah. have space. And then you get a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you have a reliable, a reliable partner that delivers you these things. And it's like, we're just at a point now where, you know, I look, none of these, all these companies, Lockheed, Northrop Grumman, and and Boeing and, and some of the other ones, like they don't move all that fast and they often subcontract with each other because they understand that there is a certain speed to this. And SpaceX is a company that's moving lightning lightning fast compared to where uh uh some of these i mean at least where the pace of space contracting was before and i think it's fair yeah. to say that that there, there are are alternate timelines i mean there are alternate companies that are taking unconventional approaches that are folding and, and troubled and having to be sold and resold uh, what was paul allen's company again that just got uh uh, uh bought the uh oh yeah, uh, like Strata launch, but yeah, you yeah, got, yeah, got acquire. Like, yeah, like, 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 yeah. Right. SpaceX appears to have picked the right strategy and is moving in the right direction, and 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 thankfully is doing very, very well, and we're all better off for it. But um, for every SpaceX, there's you know there's a Virgin Galactic uh, that's 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 having difficulties, or a you know a Blue Origin that isn't moving as fast as it would like, or a, or a, um, a Strata launch that uh, is oh. is troubled. Yeah, I think that I would say that part of what's helped SpaceX is that they've one is the integration of outside methods. Like somebody's pointed out, they've had they've, you know, there are a lot of great people, but SpaceX came from other people. You know, they brought Lou Gerstemeyer from NASA now works for SpaceX, and they bring in some industry people, great. But then they take you know you have Elon Musk who also runs Tesla, and so he's understood you know mass manufacturing, and so you get that where you get some of these some of these divisions with these aerospace corporations, you know. They're like, we know how to build one, but like it's just important. We're going to subconscious act, contract this out to some company, you know, you know, across the country, and it'll take eight months to get it. SpaceX tries to do a lot as much as they can in house, which like Tesla did, and Tesla got criticized for it. But they're like, we want to control our supply chain. Some things you can't do that for, but a SpaceX rocket is SpaceX makes the engine. SpaceX makes so much of the stuff. Like when we went to the factory, we saw. All the things we're able to do in-house, and also the fact that we saw the guys with the wrenches working on the rocket engines, and then there's the tower with the offices and the engineers who designed them. And so if the guy on here is like, oh, can I use, hey, these bolts? Is it okay if we use this different length bolt? 
they just go call the guy and he comes down on the floor. And, and that's also, they were at the sweet spot of uh, uh, 3D printing technology. So they were able to create, you know, uh, fabricated parts right there on the facility. I mean, uh, part of it is a function of embracing, um, you know, emerging technologies at just the right time that worked out well mm -hmm. for them. Yeah, and it's, and well, it, that, and it, yeah, and I, but yeah, I just think that that flat sort of structure, I mean, you, just because you think about like, if you go to, I'm oh, sorry, if you go to Cape Canaveral, and you go walk through the different sort of department, like, oh, this is this is this company does their assembly here. They do this here. They ship this from Georgia over here. And then Alabama makes this part. And then this comes from here. And then you realize, like, just moving this stuff back and forth. And the fact that the guy building this and the guy with the blueprints who designed it are in different time zones and, you know, how that affects stuff to get made. Yeah. Uh, well, here's something that can affect this podcast, and that is patreon.com slash weird things. That is where you, the fine folks of the internet, are making sure that we show up here each and every Monday to talk about the uh, fantastic, talk about the realistic, and talk about the borderlands between the two here on the Weird Things podcast. Uh, you get, on the, uh, get on the train, and you get the custom RSS feed gets you things just a touch faster than they would otherwise. It is patreon.com slash weird things. And we thank you for your patronage. Ah, uh, gentlemen, it's that time of year. Can you feel it in the air? Can you feel what it is? Uh, uh, face meltingly hot in Texas. Is that what you're asking? The beginning yeah. of a hundred days of a hundred degrees plus in Austin. Is, is, is that the time of year? Now let's talk more about Mars. Let's talk about Mars not being so Texas centric, Brian. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there are days that I think <laughs> that it's hot enough that I'm just like, God, just just three seconds on Mars. Just flash me there <laughs> and then flash me back. I think I'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've noticed that there's a pattern of Martian. You know, Mars has seasons, too. And we've been noticing now that there is around this time part of the Martian year, uh, very elongated cloud forms. They get this very long cloud. If you go look at this cloud on Mars, you can see this cloud that is like like a thousand miles long. Is that is that Olympus Mons? Is that is that like a no? No. Oh, okay. No. All right. No. So so it's it's not like um, based on a geographic feature or. It's, it's well, no, it would be, it, it appears to be like coming from a crater or some aspect with it. So it probably is, you know, a bunch of like uh, vapor or something coming from probably, you know, underground ice, etc. So, so we should hashtag, uh, we get at Mars, you vape. <laughs> like it's just blowing <laughs> massive clouds. Yeah. But it's, you know, one of these very interesting features of it because we think of Mars being a very static planet. We think of Mars as just sort of like it's just this dead planet. Geologically speaking, we're not quite sure yet if there's, you know, much going on as far as like, you know, uh, any kind of uh, volcanic activity. But we see things like this where when the weather changes a little bit, we can tell that there are things happening too ice stuff, et cetera, underground or CO2, you know, there's, you know, there's dry ice there, et cetera, like the polar caps, et cetera. That's anything too, is watching those shrink and expand. We, we might've talked about this before, but um, uh, before he passed, Carl Sagan proposed that one of the Mar Mars probes, they should spend the extra, you know, mass from weight, you know, very, very precious and expensive to put a microphone on there uh, so that we could just listen to the wind blowing on Mars. We could actually hear what it, you know, because, uh, you know, he was obviously very big into the poetry and, um, you know, making uh, uh, space accessible and real to uh, uh, quote unquote normal humans. Um, but uh, uh, I always thought that was a haunting and wonderful idea. And I hope somebody <laughs> does it. Yeah, I'd be curious to see what's on the payload packages as we, what just launched, by the way, we were worried about the, uh, again, another big space week. Mars Perseverance, the Mars 2020 mission, you know, with the Mars 2020 rover, et cetera, that launched. We were worried about that making the window and it took off and that's heading to Mars. And that's got a lot of lot of that's going to have the Perseverance rover. It's going to have the Ingenuity helicopter, which we're all going helicopters on Mars. <laughs> well, that's I crazy. Mean, we already have SUVs on Mars. Why not? You know, it's like, let, let's let's put a Navy on Mars while we're at it. <laughs> Well, that's yeah. That's we've talked about that before. Like the uh, Perseverance weighs a uh, thousand kilograms. Okay, 
this is a big beast and I'm looking through and it's got a ton of different probes on there. So I'm looking through to see, I wonder if they, the microphone might be interesting. I know they're going to have a lot of cool sound stuff. Well, right. and, and I think nowadays also uh, uh, the sensitivity of the instruments are probably enough that they could manufacture what the sounds of Mars sound like, you know, but, but, uh, you know, this is you know, what, 30, 40 years ago, he's saying, put a microphone on there so we can hear. <laughs> and, then, and it's like, uh, yeah, I don't know that that's in the budget. He's like, wait, guys, no, but it, just imagine everyone's all like, listen to Mars. <laughs> You know, there's a there's a precedent for that. I'm trying to find the, res the the item on that. There was the one of the people who directed was working on Hubble, uh, uh, Bob Williams, and he said, "Hey, um, let's aim Hubble at a dark part of the sky where there's nothing there." Oh, and that, people are like, yeah, that, yeah, yeah that, that's sort that, of like that's the 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 deep field image, right? The uh, uh, well, just just jump to the story. It's fine, bro. Oh, oh, fine. oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got I got excited <laughs> because I, I I know I, 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 I I'm like yeah, I know this, this was one. I'm very excited. All right, <laughs> this was. They're like, it's a dumb idea. Why would you do that? There's nothing. It's dark. Why would you aim the telescope at a dark spot in the sky? And they were right, and they never did it. Move on to the next story. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, tell them what happened. No, of tell course, them what happened. Of course they did it. They're like, well, do your dumb idea. We'll point at a black, dumb, nothing there part of the sky. And instead, what they get is one of the most spectacular images that Hubble ever produced, the Hubble deep field image, where a totally perceived as black, dark part of the sky is filled with with a un seemingly uncountable number of not stars, but freaking galaxies galaxies of stars uh, just uh, reinforcing just how uh, incredible and incomprehensible the the universe is yeah uh i don't know if this one led to the deep field but this was another example though of, yeah of just how incredible what it is you leave that you know leave the the, the electronic shutter open for 100 hours and you know it's just it's it's like you think like Leon Hook, you know, I'm, oh, this drop of water. I'm going to test my microscope out on this because clearly it'll be pure. Ah, what are these things floating around in there? Oh, you know? dude, that was, my fa that was my favorite part of life science was uh, 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 he called them wee beasties. Is that what he called them? Probably, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he uh, was looking at, look at all the other things he looked at under the microscope, too. Oh, yeah. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> Uh, uh, so, yeah, so, yeah, uh, uh, yeah Leeuwenhoek, uh, just took a, a drop of clear water and peeked in and, and was blown away, uh, seeing, you know, what we now understand as microscopic life. And, uh, uh, he basically looks down and sees a freaking zoo. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. Kind of terrifying. You just look at your glass of probably brown water back then and like, <laughs> oh God, <laughs> start not drinking anything. And still took a long time for germ theory to come into play. And still today, we still, yeah. oh, I want a hug. <laughs> <laughs> we we just, we, uh, the family just uh, uh, two nights ago finished The Good Place. And uh, one of the last episodes, they meet a character who uh, 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 died a very long time ago and was good. And they're like, why are you in, a good, in The Good Place? And he says, uh, uh, he's like, I help the poor. And he's like, what did you die of? I got a cut. In my time, you got a cut if, and you died. If you drank water that wasn't warm enough, you died. <laughs> Man, I would have loved to have a vac vaccine. And you guys seem to hate them. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> uh, I want to uh, do one more story here. Something sure. we talked about a while ago. We Remember the demo that Adobe did of the ability to copy of voices and to have mm -hmm. like, to, to, to make edit voices? And we've talked about some other technologies come a long ways where you can cut up and mix voices and stuff. Did we talk about, did we cover recently one of the latest developments with like that? Like now everybody's doing this. Like there's a bunch of startups doing different kind of technology and letting you clone your own voice and edit it. And there's an online demo somebody put up that shows you that like what one coder can do. If you go to vo.codes, this person took samples of people like David Attenborough, uh, Gilbert Gottfried, Sam Altman, Craig Ferguson. Is oh, his wow. high quality ones, and he's got a bunch of other ones. And so you just enter in, and the more text you enter, the, the better. If you go in there and go to a high quality one first, um, and then give them something big, you know, <laughs> give them something interesting to say. Um, and just to show you, there's a lot of you can the 
to, the way to do this, there's like models like Tacotron, which, you know, I didn't name was, I think it was Google developed that. These other sorts of models that allow you to be able to create, you know, uh, the synthesized voices and people are continuously finding ways to improve them, make them better. And so now, you know, we're in a very interesting point where, you know, they independent developers. Haunted Okay, so uh, we've got uh, David Attenborough here, if you guys want to oh, uh, yeah. hear him speak. Here we go. He's calculating. He's calculating. Yeah, so it's going to go there. Take Can the you text, believe this freaking frog is amazing? I'm glad it, and I'm David Attenborough. <laughs> <laughs> Can, can we can, can we find out what uh, Gilbert Godfrey thinks of the Weird Things podcast? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, what, what this made me think of the moment uh, I was unfamiliar with the story, but the moment you said it, um, uh, the moment you know something is possible, all of a sudden everybody can do it, and somehow, even though they, you know, Adobe never. I, as far as I know, they, they, you know, they're reserving that technology for high-end projects and, and super expensive behind-the-scenes stuff. You got to work with them. Like, but by publicly releasing that demo, the world now knows that it's possible. So, of course, a billion people are going to... Uh, well, I, I mean, in this case, it was more... There had already been published research on how to do this. And like I said, there's a model out there called Tacotron and versions of it that you can find on GitHub. And it's people going and saying, you know, researchers published something two years ago and people did it. And a year later, there's a better model. And so everybody goes and downloads this and plays with this and sort of does it. And it was Adobe was one of many people kind of working in this area. And they didn't publish their stuff. But this is based on stuff that's kind of Tacotron 1 or 3 or versions. And I don't know if it's based on Taco, but I'm saying there's all these the weird thing about AI and ML stuff. is like you could open AI has GPT-2, which got published, and you could now play with that version if you had the instances and were able to run it you could be able to do that and so and then if you wanted to change it and tweak it and then you could you know and, you know change things or whatever so mm -hmm. that's part of the big thing there it's more like just go to github download it now make your own version uh so yeah we did just get an itunes review here from gilbert godfrey oh sweet uh we're requesting it and calculating it and toodly doodling it he's skyping in right now i freaking yeah. love the weird things podcast it gets me my weekly dose of space X spiders and yes, snakes space elevator. I'm Gilbert Gottfried. That's the highest quality one. Okay. And, uh, yeah. So the highest quality one <laughs> uses the Justin Robert Young trick of it always ending an impression by announcing well, who you are. That's, that's uh, science over here. Is, uh... <laughs> Tagging that on the end. It, they should be able to say their own name, I would think. They should, yeah. This is this is this is pretty cool. Still I feel like it definitely has some ways to go with some of the some of the speech. But that's cool, man. And there's a lot of voices. Is this I wonder if this is similar to um there is a YouTube channel that I think we talked about on the show a little while ago that like uh has like the president's reading raps yeah and and stuff yeah. like that because i see that they've got pre various presidents in here too well didn't they wound up banning the channel wasn't that the news story was is uh, that there was uh a video got taken down but i don't know that the channel okay. was, was removed um man no i mean look we we have miles to go on where we are ethically and where we are from terms of, from a terms of service perspective on uh on on these kinds of like deep fake things like because i can see very quickly if you are craig ferguson or david attenborough or or gilbert godfrey the the things that you could as this technology gets better the things that you can have them say is like something that i would imagine if it was really if it was my voice i'd be like ah I want some kind of control on this, depending on the platform it's getting published on. Well, and so, and, and we've talked a bit about it before, but it's like, man, how do you, how do you handle the fingerprinting on, on a video event, a news event, a, a press release? I mean, so Adobe actually announced today, by the way, which it was funny because this was already, the story was in the, the hopper for that was Adobe's announced a new initiative, which is for photographs and stuff. And as a way to sort of fingerprint stuff. 
at the sort of like the file level. And the idea that would be that when you, you get the photo, there would be some sort of way to know. And that might be the sort of thing in the future when you get a photo or video or whatever, is that when you're encoding the stream or whatever, you use sort of a thing to sort of an authenticity key or something. Yeah, and I guess and, uh, we, we have a little bit of that, um, I guess, uh, not not exactly fingerprinting, but, but you know, every time you take a photo, it geotags it, and it says what kind of camera mm -hmm. was used and all this stuff. The metadata, but of course, that could be faked or whatever. Um, that'll be interesting. I think, yeah, we've talked about this before, about uh, it's, you know, the, the argument like, well, we had Photoshop, and it's, you know, we were fine. It's like, yeah, but... Photoshop didn't have like a million bots trying to create photos of your mother to confuse you or deceive you or artificial videos, you know, people like, you know, getting a random Skype call and I pick it up like, oh, Justin, how are you doing? Oh, speaking I of, fine. Yeah, of I Skype need your calls, bank account. We, I just, we just got a new iTunes review for the Weird Things podcast. So I just want to make sure we all get a chance to hear it and listen to it. I very like and I love listening to the Weird Things boys, Andrew, Justin. And Brian, every week on the Thing Podcast, five stars, and I'm Betty Blake. <laughs> <laughs> a little sandwich. So, you announce it up front and at the end. That's good. And so just, she's got, just, a, she's just, got just, an accent on that one a little bit. I also, so, she misspelled weird one one of those times. Mm. The background on how this gets better is like the way this works right now is they take a ton of samples of somebody's voice with transcripts of what those words are, and then. For the audio, like you'll see this waveform, and I don't know for this, but sometimes that waveform, you see that image, it's actually using that image to encode and decode the voice. It's basically using image generation to do it. And so you're you're compressing, you're compressing the heck out of it a lot. And then when you're creating that one, you're taking this sort of very compressed version of the voice and reconstructing it, and you get a lot of loss. But if you just said, I'm gonna put 10 times more resources into creating this voice, it will get better. It will get better. It is. It oh, is absolutely. more has to do with the sampling size. Yeah, I mean, I oh. mean, uh, 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 you're not you're not going to take uh, the resources of the NSA and put it behind a, 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 a demo website like this. No, mm -hmm. no, exactly. And, and that's just like a lot of these, like a lot of image recognition algorithms we've mentioned this before. They'll take a big image and compress it down and try to recognize it from that which you lose a lot of detail. And that's when we get into some of the, you know, some of the other issues, the problems of facial recognition is you just start increasing that sample size. It's going to get spookier and spookier and spookier until, you know, and I've seen there's demos. I don't know if we showed one before that could just listen to three seconds of your voice and emulate it. Well, and man, it's going to be a legitimate problem in, in 10 and of course I say 10, so that means cut it in half five. Like there'll be entire chunks of civilization that are, that truly believe that a person doesn't exist or, or, or that, you know, entire events never happened and they'll have, you know, credible reason to, to say and think so. And like this technology yeah. is, is becoming very available. There's a podcast editing app on the Mac called Descript. Mm, yes. And mm -hmm. they have uh, a similar feature where you can just type into it and it will generate uh, audio based on the audio that you fed that you fed it to like cover up parts of your script. Um, it's uh, d mm -hmm. doesn't that also give you the ability to um, like uh, 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 10 years ago, if you wanted to, let's say there's a misstep or a curse or whatever, it's hard to know where they are. You, if you didn't mark it, you're, you're hosed. But but uh, is this the same software that 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 transcripts it so that you can there say are like, a lot of where, where's there the now. part where yeah where that, where so and so curse yeah the, uh, uh, Descript is one of many softwares out there where you feed it audio and it creates a transcript um, yeah. and based on how you do it it can do it on speakers and stuff um, speaking of speakers we did just get another iTunes review and I do want to make sure oh thank just, goodness I just, oh, oh wow good I just, just want to make wow. sure that we read and support the community yeah by saying that. yeah anyway. listen that must be a um, Simonson, I love this podcast, the Weird Things podcast. I can't get enough of spires and goblins. Um, Simmons. Oh, it really no, does. No, it doesn't it, like JK. If it, yeah, if it doesn't know how to say it, it won't. It just won't say it at all. So Chuck Luckers and G Dang it didn't quite make it in. Thank yeah. you, JK Simmons. Five stars. <laughs> <laughs> Not my tempo. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we all we all remember the days when we could tell the difference. Enjoy it now, you know. <laughs> no. Uh gentlemen, picks. Uh I watched a movie this morning with the whole family and I loved it. Uh it's Battlestar Galactica set in World War II. 
The joke I'm making, of course, is that Battlestar Galactica is apparently based on the structure of a destroyer <laughs> and protecting a fleet. Uh, uh, I'm talking about the movie Greyhound. That's a, a mm -hmm. Apple Plus uh, ori uh, original, which uh, if you listen to in interviews, according to Bryce, uh, uh, to Bryce, Tom, uh, I, I don't know who said it, but somebody said if you listen to Tom Hanks, maybe it was Justin that said it. Uh, uh, it sounds like Tom Hanks really wanted this to make it to the movie theaters. And is, that was yeah, we reported that on Court Killers. It was a story on Court Killers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but 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 uh, uh, but you could see why, man. Uh, this belongs in a movie theater. It's great. It uses if you've ever seen Battlestar Galactica and loved it, you will instantly recognize that everything about Battlestar Galactica, the structure. Of uh, the function of the ship, uh, the job of protecting the fleet, the uh, the command hierarchy, uh, everything from the captain of the XO on down uh, to to marking bearings, uh, to making contact, uh, all of that is there. It's like it is electric, and I absolutely loved it. And uh, it was it was it's a really I watched it as well for because we've got it on spoiler in time this week. It was great, and I think one of the things that it really has going for it is that. Um, it's only 90 minutes. It's yeah. like, I think if it were, uh, you probably could find another 20 minutes of story. Cause like, uh, Tom Hanks's character kind of has one note and it's, I gotta get back to my girl. Um, which is fine for a 90 minute film. Um, and it's a lot of like giving out orders and, and, and all that stuff. But also you, you get in, you get into the vernacular and all really quickly. So there's not a lot of over explanation of what these things that they're saying are. Um, and also like, Big spectacle moments. That that moment at the end where they do where the ship hey! does the thing. Yeah. No. Uh, oh my th God. Right. Well, and and what was really fun for me is um, <laughs> because the kids really enjoyed Master and Commander. Um, I I was able to get them to to watch, and I agree. Uh, uh, I don't think I could have gotten Penny to watch it if it wasn't only ninety minutes long. Also, I don't know that I could have taken much more than ninety minutes of the intensity of this movie <laughs> because it is electric and 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 uh, clinching. Um, but I'm if sorry, I, I was. I was looking stuff up. We're talking about the one where the, the ship is trying to outrun the bad guys. They're getting picked off one by one. That was like Battlestar Galactica. Uh, yes. We already reviewed Last Jedi. Why are we talking about Last okay. Jedi? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, but it, uh, what was really... Torpedo! <laughs> it, it actually <laughs> took us nearly two and a half hours to watch because... Really? Well, well because the kids, um, they were interested enough in the visualization of everything. And... Um, uh, and, and I kept having a pause to explain what a countermeasure was, what a depth charge mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. the difference between radar and sonar and, and, and why this is happening. And, well, why, why can't he just interrupt this, this guy? And, you know, it's like, well, this is the way radios work or whatever. Uh, also, throughout the entire thing, uh, man, oh, man, it's like uh, uh, when you get through the first battle, you're like, man, if I live through something like that, I would be grandpa never failing to shut up about it. Uh, you know, if I, and it's like, oh, you, you see all the guns going off and, and it's like, oh, that's why grandpa would, was deaf, you know? <laughs> and it's like, oh, you, you lose somebody you love uh, and you're there for the funeral. No wonder grandpa wouldn't shut up about old Charlie or whatever. It's like, it, it yeah. makes it so real mm -hmm. in such a powerful way. I, I, I loved it. I loved it a lot. I, you know, my grandfather was like the opposite and he was a very quiet guy. You get him talking, whatever. And I didn't know until after he passed away, I read his biography. He wrote about his autobiography about when he served in the European theater and then literally not, does not making stuff up. He was like storming machine gun nests and grenading stuff. Holy and I'm like, cow. holy crap. I'm like, what? The? And he had, he had kept pushing to be in the frontline duty because he had, he had to wear glasses. But once he reached a certain rank, he could assign himself to that. I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like, I know why he doesn't talk about this. <laughs> it's like, Jesus. They're like, holy crap. It was, like, oh, I was like, just reading the sort of accounts and stuff. I'm like, oh, yeah, the day that. But, you know, his CO, the second in charge, then the guy below him all got killed, but he wasn't there because he had gotten a pass, a day pass, because he wrote an essay and then came. I'm like, holy crap. Like, you know, mm -hmm. just the quiet guy smoking a cigar, you know, walking my grandmother's Alasa Opso, you know, out at night in New Mexico. I'm like, ah, I get it now. It's it's yeah. it's great and wastes no time. And and yeah. and and it's really novel because they replace the Cylons with Germans, which I would never would have huh. thought to do. And uh, interesting uh, take, and and it's a ragtag fleet of of many different nations that are that are you know there's there's a Greek vessel and an English vessel and 
the 13th. They, mm-hmm. they, they do that instead of the 13 colonies. Hmm. 12 colonies. Did it get sued? Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, it makes me, I, I, now I want to go back and trace uh, what books, uh, like whether or not this, because this mo- movie was based on a specific book from the 1950s, and it makes me want to know whether or not Ronald D. Moore mentions that specific book uh, in, in, you know, his formation of uh, Battlestar. Mm-hmm. But I liked it a lot. Uh, I finished uh, the most recent episodes of The Expanse. So I'm caught up on The Expanse. Uh, uh, by and large, really, really liked it. I, I thought that this most recent season, boy, you can tell the difference in quality when uh, all of a sudden uh, the richest man on the planet uh, loves your show and you are exclusive on his platform because... Uh, Boy, those location shots look a lot better. Uh, <laughs> the action, like it goes from a show that has like v- science fiction action. So it's a lot of like, <laughs> we don't really have, we got a stunt coordinator, but mostly this is going to be people staring at each other with guns and maybe pushing each other to like by the finale of the most recent season. It's a full one unbroken, one unbroken shot, shot. Uh, like Jason Bourne uh, uh, level amazing uh, action stuff. So uh, I, I I enjoyed it uh, uh, quite a bit, uh, really an achievement. And uh, I was happy to hear that they were done shooting the next season before all the pandemic hit. So hopefully we'll get that uh, sooner rather than later. Nice. I got a pick. Uh, I heard about this the other day. I think it was yesterday and I couldn't do anything about it because it it takes Sundays off. Uh, It is uh, my new favorite obsession. It's a little thing called baseball. So this is a simulated baseball league uh, where there are all sorts of wacky rules and there's betting. Uh, so every week is a season Monday through Friday is a season of simulated baseball. In fact, they're just finishing up day three of the season for, of today of this, of the day for the hour. So Monday through Friday is the season. Every hour is a day and a game. Uh, they have like 16 teams that are all playing and, um, and it's super cool. Like it's simulated baseball, but, uh, there's, uh, there's a like Man, big upset it, between the breath mints and the firefighters. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't know. Right, I didn't know that up. these were real things. I, I, I saw you, you uh, tweeted out all these logos that mm. some of them, I love that the Charleston shoe thieves That's thought right. was <laughs> exceptional. So my team, uh, my, I, my, my personal team is the Hawaii Fridays. It's Island time. <laughs> um, and we've just been getting our butts handed to us by the, uh, the San Francisco lovers all day. Um, and I don't think that'll change because see, so, so, so the lovers were uh, worst in their division last season, and so now they have uh, they were elected to be given four strikes, and so whenever they are up to bat, they get four strikes instead of three. <laughs> oh my god, uh, that would be an amazing adjustment to the game. It's an incredible <laughs> um, sort of advantage. Uh, <laughs> the Wild Wings versus the Spies. The Mexico Wild Wings versus the uh, the Houston Spies. That's right. <laughs> the uh, uh, the Dallas Stakes are on here. Yeah, the Dallas Stakes. Um, and so, and so, yeah, you kind of got fun, wacky team names. Uh, but the other part of this, so you can look at the thing while it's happening and just play along and bet. But also the other part of it is they have a discord server. And so they have like a live watch channel and then each team has their own channels and everyone kind of, you figure out what everyone's kind of, uh, attitude is so like on the fridays one it's just like hey man whatever we're just having fun out there we're just playing the game for the fun of it um and then you like watch the the live watch party channel where it's like super fast and you you, and because everyone all the games happen at the same time so you'll just see we are from chicago (laughs) 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 and then like a few minutes later you'll see go back to chicago (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is amazing it's really fun it's it's free uh it was really easy to sign up for i they have like apple like the apple sign in thing that you can do like other normal simon st- sign and stuff too but it was it was really easy to just be like boop and then i have it um you just pick a favorite team but you can bet and they give you free coins um and yeah at the end of every week they do uh they hold elections to 
give benefits to different players to different teams and stuff so uh yeah i don't know i think this is really this is really cool and i am i'm really digging it blaseball.com that's awesome andrew my pick is if you want more world war ii stuff uh hey you know it's better than world war ii World War Three. Literally everything. It was a horrible oh, event. Okay. Uh, anything yeah. is better. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> but uh, the next, the the point zero 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 one thing that's better. World War Two in color. Have you ever watched this documentary series? Uh, I, I I've seen uh, little bits of footage here and there. Uh, and you're not talking about the uh, the World the War Peter One, Jackson yeah, not one. that one that was colorized. No. But but no, this they is, shall not grow old. No, that's yeah. It. Uh, uh, this is actual footage that was shot in color in the very early days of color film, right? No, this this was black and white footage that's been, that may have been originally color, then converted to black and white, and done a really crappy conversion process to color. But as a documentary, it's really good. The color process is an old, they used, it looks like bad Turner sort of version of this. But forgetting that, the amount of documentary footage they have is incredible. And so basically it is, goes through, you know, the post-World War I, what's the situation in Europe and America, the rise of Hitler, rise and fall and rise, et cetera, what's going on in the world, just a really good global look at what was going on from and in the Pacific theater, you know, uh, uh, Japan's invasion of Manchuria, all the things that go before. I cannot recommend it enough because it's one of these things where the further away we get from it, the more condensed the story gets and the more details get left out. And this is a 13 episode series that's got just a really, really good just sort of explanation of like what was going on on the different fronts. When was Germany friends with Russia? When were the enemies? You know, what happened there? What was the state of individual economies going on between places and stuff? Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of, I would say, uh, you know, their, their delineations between what made fascism and socialism and communism, I'd say, is probably a little bit from a different school of thought than maybe I would subscribe to. But that's really not as important as, um, uh, you know, they presented these, these, these opposite ends of the extreme where they're more both on the authoritarian end, but that's sort of irrelevant when it comes to just the battles and what happened, you know, in each place. Wow, that's cool. It's on Netflix. Yeah. Uh, just, just, I'm listening, I'm watching, I'm like, man, there's so much I forgot in high school. There's so many details I didn't realize. And then like, you know, why was Guadalcanal important? You know, we know it was a big battle. What was the big deal about Guadalcanal? You know, there's the movie Midway. Why do we care about Midway? Why was that a big deal? And then you look at the context of this, you're like, oh, I get why this was a big deal, you know? Yeah. Um, and the the events of the movie Greyhound, you know, you understand the context of where that came into play and why that was such a big deal. Yeah, they did a so, uh, they they did a good job of of sort of you know set, setting that up. Cool, cool. So that's my pick. Nice. World War Two. <laughs> it also looks like they might have these on YouTube, just if someone doesn't have Netflix. Um, mm -hmm. uh, World War Two in HD color. What might be what you want to look for in that? That's cool. Uh, yeah. Looks like it's spelled yeah. British style too. Kalur. 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 Yeah. But uh, that's just a side note too. There have been people taking like really, really old film footage and then using some of the upresing techniques and the color, the newer colorization techniques and putting that on YouTube. And like if you type in like, uh, you know, old footage of Beijing or other places like London, like 1960s, it's captivating because you it's just kind of random sort of documentary sort of footage just people hanging out and doing stuff and like you london looks like straight out of the set of austin powers it really looks like that and then you know the best part of the london one is it looks so weird and then you see somebody wearing a dylan t-shirt <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, was it on weird things that we talked about the train pulls into station up resing yeah with mm -hmm. the colorization and yeah. all that oh, that was astonishing but hey, go back to what Bryce just showed there. But look at that. That would be uh, would that be Beijing or is that what were yeah, we looking Beijing at? Beijing around 1920. 1920. Okay, look at this. And it's like it's you know you've got the the traditionally dressed people. You know the the the, the ponytails, the hats, you know the caps, all the sort of stuff. You know the guy carrying like right out of a movie kind of thing. And you know you talk about a rapid development of an economy. If you go look at, let's say, Tokyo, 1920, you're going to see people in bowler hats and business suits, et cetera. 
Wow. Um, which sort of sets up why why was Japan able to go invade and take over such large parts of China, being in those smaller countries, was just a modernization. Mm. So wow. it's insane. So just a fun thing to go look at if you want to check that out. So just look up like old footage, like really old, and be surprised what you can find. Cool. Gentlemen, it's been weird. Hey, look at that. Yeah. All right. We'll get a turnaround for after things here in just a moment. I just took a wash on that entire day's events of baseball, so that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> the hard-hitting news that matters. <laughs> it's just every, it's the news. It's six. Every, everyone <laughs> underperformed. The millennials lost. The garage is lost. The moist talkers. <laughs> oh, the moist talkers did win. I did get coins on the moist talkers. <laughs> All right, everybody. Back to things here. Uh, yeah, and if you need to take a break, now is a good time to go do that. Mm -mm -mm. How's everybody's weekend? I guess have a good weekend. Uh, yeah, it's pretty really good. Yeah. Um, been working here on the uh, the set a little bit. Got some um, stuff coming in, but uh, trying to figure out how to uh continue to make uh the set uh exciting for um you know the coming the coming politics coverage mm -mm. are you going to try to have a hybrid set where you sit and and can stand or are you going to move over to full stand uh i'll, I'll always sit for these shows so it's like this mm -hmm. is basically uh the same shot like i'm not moving the camera to go from here to here I see. um but I'm just kind of cropped in. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, with its uh, standing, then, you know, I can have a little bit more going on. And um, I, uh, uh, you know, there's there's also some other stuff and I'm screwing around with like uh, mm -hmm. some of the visual, the in, in computer stuff, um, which is, uh, you know, just to kind of continue to make things cool mm. so people want to watch on the internet yeah um you want to help me pick my bets for the next set of yeah of yeah yeah points? who's who's uh, who's surgeon let me oh i have to sign back in oh my gosh and also who did this I mean, is, are these like known known people um it the is baseball a, uh oh, what is the name of the company it's like an indie game company and i don't remember their name um the game <laughs> band is who did it okay so we've so got uh uh let's see so uh, first off okay we've got to play for the fridays magic v fridays the magic's three and oh fridays are zero and three uh Bean, yeah beans an all right pitcher it's going to be peanuts weather uh so it's a close <laughs> bet what does peanuts mean? Um, we're no one is quite sure. We're not a hundred percent sure, but I always bet maximize oh, so, on Fridays. Okay, yeah. Uh, crabs v wild wings. The crabs are zero and three. Wild wings are zero and are two and one. No, bet the crabs. Bet the crabs. Okay. Yeah, we'll give them. Uh, we'll give them. You always. Seven. Yeah, you always want to. Um, Go for. You always want to make sure that. Yeah, that their, you're, their, you're, their slogan you're, you're, is "You can never get rid of us." You're betting. You're betting on the snap back there. <laughs> Soft shells, hard balls. <laughs> uh, tigers pies. Tigers are three and zero. Pies are only one and two. And bet the pies. Bet the go pies. Underdogs. Go underdog. Go underdog. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm only gonna give him a five though. That's only a five. That's five. Five. Bet. Uh, let's see. The garages v the sunbeams. Garages are a heavy favorite. I it's like a solar eclipse though. And it is a solar eclipse. But the sunbeams won during a solar eclipse. <laughs> Yeah. Part of the <laughs> so I am gonna give I am gonna give they it to the sun beams. <laughs> um, just uh, the moist talkers v the spies. Oh god, the spies are a heavy favorite. Take the spies there. That looks like a yeah. In fact, they're gonna get they're gonna get my big bet. All right. Uh, the rest. Oh, uh, actually, tacos. Tacos. Uh, tacos paid out on a, like a fifteen inning overtime game uh, an hour ago. So. <laughs> 
Put one on the shoe thieves for me. I just love that name, the shoe thieves. Well, I'm like <laughs> breath mints. Like, what are you get out of here? Breath what is what is the shoe thieves uh, slogan? Oh, the shoe thieves slogan is "Your kicks are my kicks." <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> right. Charleston Actually, that's, shoe that's thieves. That's quite literally what shoe thieves do, isn't it? Yeah. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, let me see here. Oh, we did get here. We go. Do, do, do. <laughs> Yes. In fact, uh, Andrew, I'm going to forward you this question that we just got for after things. But I can't read. Uh, okay. <clears throat> well, then I'm happy to. It's a good one. It's from our old buddy, James. Our one listener. <laughs> can, I, can I block out his? He's our, um, we're, we're like a, the show is, um, Three Dr. Freuds and 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 uh, James is our perpetual person on the couch. <laughs> and then we realize who needs the most help. It's not the guy in the couch. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Also, Gambling Man, thank you again for resubscribing. 38 months. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Welcome back. Wow. Yeah, I've been doing a while, huh? Yeah. Um mm-mm. But I think this is a, this is a good question and applicable, I think, to most uh, social media platforms. So I think that'll be an easy, easy slam dunk, frankly, or a home run. Yeah, as it might be. Um, ready to roll? I think I'm good. Andrew, how are you? I'm good. Sure. Oh, great! This actually segues into what I want to talk about. Perfect. Oh, cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right, then I'm going to catch you in for after things in three, two. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I am Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. And Justin Robert Young. Hey. So uh, let's talk about TikTok. Tick tock, mm. tick tock. <laughs> Wait, is that, can we call the segment Tick Tock, Tech Talk? Yeah. Okay. But yes, only if you enunciate it like that every time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, for yeah, if my grandmother is miraculously alive and listening in, uh, Tick Tock is a platform <laughs> that became very popular the last look almost a little over a year ago. It just sort of kind of went supernova. Um, it was a very interesting sort of origin story of a very well-financed company saying, let's build a social network, let's acquire Musical.ly. And they bought an existing platform and then basically rebranded it and spent millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars of promoting it. And boom, TikTok be everywhere. TikTok, the new hotness. Snap, what's that? Snapchat, who heard of this? What? I don't know. TikTok, <laughs> now you're talking. And now you're talking. Obviously, oh, TikTok, so they should yeah. use that. Yeah, You're look G-O-K, who's TikToking yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, uh, I couldn't pass the Communist Party uh, purity check, wow. so they would never hire me. <laughs> yeah. So uh, TikTok is now in the news because the the issue is that there was a lot of stuff coming up where TikTok was doing things like looking at clipboards on phones and stuff, which other companies have done that too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the fact that like many Chinese companies, the actual ownership of controls kind of murky in the fact that when you have a, a power like China, which bans, you can't have Facebook in China. You can't use YouTube in China. You can't use a number of things that we do because China's like, nah, we, we don't, you know, for whatever reasons, you know, there, those things are banned there. The questions then come up now, like, Hey, should we be letting, a company like TikTok, which is owned by the Chinese, have an app that can tell your location and all this other data that may be used in places where we don't want exposed to foreign powers, so to speak. That's that issue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So now this talk Separate. of like yeah. So so now we yeah. move now for the politics angle. We toss to Justin Robert Young. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously, post COVID. Um, there has been a hard uh, uh, move against China in terms of popularity, and that is uh, in rare in our modern era, kind of uh, across both sides of the aisle. Uh, Democrats or Republicans particularly have fond feelings for China post 
uh, uh, coronavirus, and there's a lot of stuff that is kind of getting more attention now than it probably w- uh, has in the past. But uh, with China hawks in ascendancy, uh, you're seeing a lot of uh, a, a lot of kind of wish list stuff that now is at the forefront, and one of those things is. TikTok, considering that the government is very much broadly in a mood to discuss uh, what data is coming in and how it's being regulated with American companies, the idea of a supernova uh, in in popularity in, in TikTok uh, continuing to explode and passing all that data over to the Chinese is uh, uh, something that you know became a national security thing. And who knows whether or not there's anything else below the surface that we haven't heard, but, uh, who, you know, in parallel over the last week, there was questions of whether or not the federal government would step in and ban the app based on national security issues or, uh, whether or not TikTok could sell to an American company and chiefly whether or not that sale would involve any kind of uh, data being accessible or ownership by the ByteDance Corporation, which is based in China. So to, Microsoft released a blog post today talking about that, hey, we are in talks and we're in talks with TikTok to look into acquiring them to sort of kind of make an easy sort of transition from the Chinese owners to an American owners where the data would be held, you know, under American data laws, et cetera. So we just wanted to sort of set up sort of the background because the question we got from James Harrison, and I also just jump in at any point. I don't mean to make this a dialectic here. Uh, Harrison is, says, so over quarantine, I got my follower count on TikTok up to over 45,000. Wow, nice. But with the constant threats of, of it being banned in America, my highest follower base, what's the best way to get folks to follow you on other platforms? Mm. Can I first, I want to, and that's a great question, but I want to ask a question here. I know a bunch of people that moved to TikTok and they're all telling me they have these incredibly huge follower accounts. Like, like, and I don't know. I know that like, I know everybody, every entertainer or whatever I know who's moved there is like, I've got 40,000. I've got this many followers. They're all, and I'm like, that's great. But I keep hearing. And I'm, and I think that a follower there is different than a follower on other social media platforms because uh, I can't know this many super popular people. (laughs) Well, and your access to your followers is different on every social media platform, but especially on TikTok, it is relatively low, right? Like on YouTube, people tend to get served up the videos that they subscribe to. They have the ability to like, get notifications and stuff. There's a, a, a chronological feed of the most recent videos. TikTok really doesn't have that. Most of TikTok is like, here, we're going to serve you videos that we think are best for you. Or you can click over here. You have to click a button to see some videos from the accounts that you follow in basically random order or you can search for them and then pull up all of it like you have a very indirect access to those followers there there, there was a hot minute that i was speculating uh remember there i think it was uh um i forgot the name of it but it was basically a fake social media account that you just open an account and it just it just filled you know like you got even more followers oh, you got like, even more bot, likes yeah, or yeah. whatever bot, like the bot yeah. Net diary yeah yeah app. um and uh uh, uh there, there was a brief moment that i was speculating that maybe maybe tiktok has figured out that it feels real good to see big numbers next to stuff you produce but i think bryce it was you that was saying that uh that 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 fairly reliably the numbers have to be real or or we we saw an amount of engagement on the videos that we did for tiktok that it was it wasn't just comments and it wasn't just likes and share numbers it was like actually people making the duets where they actually have to film something and do something we got so many of those for that one video that blew up that like maybe tiktok is certainly goosing it and showing that video to a lot of people but those react those engagements to it are real you know people that's hard to it's and i don't know if it's hard but it's it would be not worth the money to fake that much video so 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 tiktok may be picking winners and losers absolutely but uh uh but they're definitely winning and they're definitely losing (laughs) well that's yeah that's part of that's part of the platform is the algorithm is that like they want you to go their preferred way for you to go is through the algorithm and so therefore they are telling you that they are picking winners and losers because they are deciding what people get pushed yeah yeah i think that and i don't i wasn't trying to imply that they're doing like fake 
followers. I think that like on TikTok, like a follow, like a follow is kind of almost more like a like on a Twitter sort of thing, as yeah. far as mm -hmm. it's easy to, it's easy. And so, and, and, and not to take anything away from any of the content people are because everybody I know who's doing this, they're making cool stuff. And, but I just sort of think like, man, like, I think there it's like bike dance was brilliant in what they did. If you look the behind the scenes, the idea of Facebook, the evolution of this sort of thing was sort of predictable in the sense that like Facebook was like, Hey, we need a lot of, have a lot of user content. So let's encourage people to make content. And then we'll come up with some algorithms to push stuff in front of people. And then ByteDance was like, yeah, we're going to just throw, shove a bunch of stuff at you that we, we're going to algorithmically choose. And then we're going to let you see, or if you want to keep seeing the things you like, you have to follow them. And just sort of that evolution of that algorithm is just scary and amazing. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, uh, they've created a very unique product and it's a product that, We'll see exactly what uh, uh, what it looks like if and when this Microsoft sale goes through. I'm surprised from the, a tech perspective that ByteDance hasn't particularly fought this, uh, or at least publicly hasn't made a big mess about it. Uh, they, I, I guess, initially wanted to retain some kind of at least financial benefit of uh, the company sold to Microsoft. That was a hard line in the sand. And so now the deal is a fully, uh, a full sale to Microsoft. And uh, the idea that the app would be totally re-engineered uh, and the, the Microsoft owned version of TikTok would, uh, would, would be here, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, but not, some of the countries in Europe, which is fascinating. All this is happening so fast. Is it, I still am not sure how this is possible. I, I'm kind of with you. I don't like, know how I, the I, president I, can say you have to right, right. sell so, so, the so, company. Uh, uh, cor correct this interpretation that that uh, uh, for me, Justin. Um, yeah. This looks to me like... Uh, uh, Trump has a reputation for trying to stir up, uh, you know, controversy and divide people or whatever. Uh, yeah. And and you know he's got he's he's got a, 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 a an attraction to messing with China in particular. It looked to me like he just looked at a menu and picked a straw man and said, "This is an existential threat. We have to enter a world where the president says Microsoft like because it it." it the, the, we're going to have a sale. You're like, I'll allow a sale of a company, but uh, where there's no bidders and only one buyer at a price that I'll decide well, if I we'll, want to allow. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll see. I don't think that the, that the, the door is totally closed on, on other bidders. Uh, uh, you know, Axios today speculated that Amazon still might not be out of the, the, the woods on trying to acquire it, but <clears throat> there's no doubt that the list of players if what you are saying is, all right, uh, this thing's going to get banned. So Donald Trump to bite dance, sell it or you're banned and you have literally no worth in the United States. And so bite dance initially is like, I mean, again, the, the strange part here is that bite dance hasn't made a big mess of this because they very well could because of the, of what you are saying, Brian, like yeah. the idea that like, Oh, well, why is this authoritarianism? Although, uh, this is not just Trump. Like uh, uh, Chuck Schumer, the leading Democrat in the Senate, was out. Oh, uh, there is. Sorry, there can is you take a, that back? Chuck Schumer was out. Chuck Schumer was out today talking about how much he believed that TikTok should be banned. And uh, so this is not a one party issue like uh, right, entrenched positions throughout the ide the ideological spectrum have turned hard against China and TikTok is looked at as something that uh, would be feeding, like that you need to end this now, lest it become even bigger and we are not able to stop it. I guess so, the closest parallel would be, uh, uh, I think it was England was refusing to upgrade to 5G because of Huawei's, you know, maybe mysterious data gathering technologies in there. What? And you have you have stuff that like ByteDance has done openly. Like they they cooperated the Chinese government to help round up Uyghur women who were like they said we need to find them and like here's the data here's the file them and then moved them to their concentration excuse me reeducation camps. They have a very bad reputation for how they've behaved internally as far as the outside world looks at for human rights issues and stuff. 
So they're not in a big position to sort of protest too strong, like, no, we're the good guys. Like, no, you literally are the bad guys in China with how you, you know, use your data to do ethnic persecution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that's the the grounds for like, you know, the idea of the ban is there is a whole board process by which other com organizations or companies have to get approved by this. And there have been instances where ByteDance may not have been sort of forthcoming by this. And the fact that if it is controlled by the government by this, then that is in a violation. There are ex export restrictions and stuff on there. How you define them, how you use them is where it becomes sort of the wiggle room on this. But it's not mm -hmm. I don't think it's as material as people make it out to be. I mean, this is. This is scary. It's a very scary sort of thing, the way it's used internally. I, I, I guess as a user, I look at it and, and go, well, I don't, I, I don't know what the Chinese government would use with personal information on me. Uh, only I'll tell you what they'll I do. In the they'll tell you to go to bed because it's 2 a.m. <laughs> well, hold on. You need to You've been watching. scrolling too long. Yeah. You got, um, but I do, but I can... Uh, uh, very clearly and concretely understand a workflow where Microsoft owns TikTok and then Microsoft, either through Azure cloud computing or any of any sort of surveillance technology that they decide to develop or have already developed and sell to the government makes TikTok a de facto government owned uh, data source. Like, well, I, I that would, I there's. I, 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 I see two I see two flavors of the same thing, except one of them is not even. <laughs> I, I, there's a lot of constitutional stuff in between there and the need for due process before you can make that evident that you can start disclosing your data. Like if the government wants to get your personal data, whatever price there is, there are checks and balances that are not always followed. And we've seen abuses of that. And that's the issue is here is to say you where do you trust if you say, yeah, it's the same thing to me. I think you need to look at it more closely. So if I was a China, if I was running a Chinese intelligence operation, I have access to ByteDance data. I want to say, okay, how many how many spouses of military husbands or wives have TikTok? Okay, now I have location data, and I can tell about movements of people in positions, mm. people in Washington D.C., political aides. Who was in whose office 15 minutes ago? Did somebody just go meet with Nancy Pelosi, and now she's going over the National Security Council because something just happened in the news about what's going on over there? The amount of data you have, and if you think, like, you know, red team it, what you can do with it is incredibly – in anybody's hands, in anybody's hands. But when you have a state actor that is actively doing what I would consider, you know, openly blazingly without criticism, you know, there is no John Oliver checking balances and stuff in China. You know, there is, there is none of that there. And so we're externally looking at this going, this is sort of scary – we have our problems here. We do, but you can talk about this. You can hop on Twitter right now and say, hey, I, I think it sucks the way the government's monitoring stuff and doing this. And you get to say that. You don't get to do that there. And the problem here, as I'm saying this, it's like, you could, if you start thinking really malevolently how the stuff, ha well, we know it's been used in the past, how you could use it, it's scary. And I think we need to have clear rules and precedents because I don't think we should prevent foreign companies to be able to do things. But you know, mm. we we bugged the phones of Angela Merkel, you know, under the last administration. We did stuff like this, and we have some system of checks and balances. Yeah, it's sort Another of, uh, as doesn't. I understand it, it's all bets are off when it comes to anything international. Like, uh, uh, yeah. that's that's why the NSA gets to, you know, just grab everything and say, they just say, well, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you, you walk in the NSA, it's midnight, he's grabbing everything in the fridge, and you're like, what you doing, buddy? And it just shouts, national security. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here's, yeah. And the crazy thing, though, is if the NSA, Brian, picks you up, picks up a conversation with you telling Jason, hey, is the suitcase full of cocaine going to be ready tonight? Right. And you're like, yeah, I got the money in the Uzis. They're like, ah, not our problem. And now it never happens to it. They don't go to DEA, they don't tell it anybody you know i guess yay and that's the that's sort of the weird thing in china if you're like ah you know you know who looks like winnie the pooh oh i know who looks like winnie the pooh bring red line next thing you know there's a knock on your door so uh From disney for copyright infringement i would imagine <laughs> i would imagine that uh, right now james harrison is screaming none of this was the question, <laughs> this is not the question. No. No. so the question uh with the constant threats what's the best way to get folks to follow you to other platforms james uh, I'm a uh, big, big fan of being highly diversified, uh, as uh, and I, I suspect Justin would agree, as, as two people who uh, were on a network, uh, uh, the, the more channels you have, uh, the better off you are. The question is, uh, TikTok, as we were just discussing in our experience, 
um, is fine for engagement on TikTok. Pretty much any vertical, any platform is fine for engagement on that platform. Um, boy, is it hard to get anybody to move from any one platform to another. To get a YouTube subscriber to sign up for your email list is difficult. Uh, that's why we do giveaways. To get anybody on your uh, uh, who reads your blog to, to uh, uh, subscribe to your video podcast, nearly impossible. Um, it's it's it, it, not impossible. It's just going to take a lot of time, and you're going to have to provide, number one, a very good reason for them to go mm -hmm. from point A to point B. Oftentimes, it's a giveaway or, you know, hey, normally this is a $50 gift uh, uh, but or a $50 book, but, you know, I'm going to give it to you as my gift to uh, just, you know, go, head on over to Twitter, hit me up on my DMs. Uh, uh, because you know, or click the link in my profile. Right. Is a big because then you can do a link tree and then you can say here's where the giveaway thing is. Like, but, yeah. But but you're gonna have to essentially set up a CRM that 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 automates getting people through a process where they are constantly getting rewards, special behind the scenes content, bonus stuff. Uh, uh, you can you can show the first half of a trick, or you can show a trick and say. Uh, uh, this is one of my favorite tricks, and I have a secret tutorial that normally costs a, a billion dollars. Uh, if you want it, all you got to do is click the link on the thing, and you're essentially doing a sales funnel for their attention to get them on other platforms. Mm -hmm. That's, that billion that, dollar tutorial, Brian, that was the best thing you ever did. <laughs> it was so good. The, the, the saddest part is uh, once you get them to the other platform, it may not be their preferred platform, and no. you may have hard fought your way into another sec another vertical that they don't use email 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 get email addresses get that is the most there's a reason why we use them now as our usernames they're the most permanent form of contact you can have beg plead whatever you know just get you know give think think of a thing like if you had a thing that you're willing to sell for 10 bucks you know that you you like, I think the value of this, and if you're like, man, what what is the lifetime value of somebody on email to me? It's probably going to be worth more than that. Oh, so yeah. it is. You know, think about like it's like look at look at these guys who started Patreons here. What what were those email addresses worth to you for your Patreons? I mean, they were they were. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was speaking with uh, Andrew Heaton last night, and how uh, Justin uh, he credits Justin with giving him his entire post. Um, uh, uh, employee career because the night before, you know, his uh, uh, last show on the network he was on, uh, Justin said, you open a Patreon right this minute <laughs> because there needs to be a place for people to go. Yeah. And if there's not yeah. a place for people to go, you will never, ever get them back. Yeah. And maybe yeah. if depending on the type of engagement or following that you've got on TikTok or that you're looking to cultivate, like... Uh, email definitely definitely make an email list but maybe maybe make a maybe make a discord or find something community focused rather than outlet focused yeah um, yeah it's free and easy to do I, I, and I then would, suddenly you have very engaged people i would i would say the biggest thing is figure out where people want to go and make the content that you feel that you can make there. Like right now, obviously there is an existential crisis with TikTok. There is a non-zero chance that things just fall apart. And, and now all of a sudden TikTok just doesn't work unless you're on a VPN, which would fundamentally crush that community. Right. Uh, but, and so at, at now, now more than ever, you want to set up things where I'm sure it'll be probably a trend with big, uh, uh, big uh, uh, players on TikTok where people are building those life rafts and they are saying like, hey, look, in case the war comes, this is where we're going. This is where I'm going to I'm going to uh, uh, be posting my stuff here and uh, maybe just start doing it there. But also remember that this isn't just an emergency switch. If you are diversifying your uh, your brand, then you need to make it worth like worth it to be there. Like, you know, I have a a, a daily newsletter but that means i gotta write that newsletter daily <laughs> it means i gotta i i have to be good at this other thing i i uh the, some of the biggest decisions that i've made over the last five years have been deciding not to do certain content not because i didn't enjoy it not because there wasn't an audience there but because i uh needed to focus on every time that i told someone to go somewhere i had to be cool with my effort on that platform 
Uh, and, and so if you have a very passive email list, that's fine, but let them know that that is just the place where you can get the billion dollar tutorial that, that you put out, but that's, that's not a guarantee of a regular thing. Uh, if you're going to a discord, then enmesh yourself in some discord communities, see how discord communities work because on one hand, yeah, it's going to be where your audience, if you already have a hardcore community, then it's going to be what it is. Otherwise bad actors will make it lame and people that go uh will think oh this sucks this isn't the tiktok fun i was used to but and and also the yeah. good news is demographically speaking um i would say that mm, uh, of, of 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 the over 40 crowd <laughs> Uh, on this podcast uh there's a lot of websites that i go to and i get right up to the part where it asks for my email and and then i'm like yeah maybe not and then i uh, I, I i don't do anything um mm. if you are under the age of uh 15 under the age of 20 then uh who boy do those people not think twice about just throwing their emails at you. So uh, the demographic that is on TikTok that's already enjoying your stuff is probably the demographic that is uh, not going to be shy about giving you their email address. Yeah. So uh, can we talk about Patreon for a second? Um, sure. sure. Have you been following the lawsuit with them regarding arbitration? No, mm -hmm. I know yep. nothing about this. Justin, you want to give a little background on what happened? So... Um, Patreon had in their terms of service uh, the fact that you, and this is standard, this is boilerplate uh, for TOSs, especially with uh, in, in Silicon Valley, that you could not sue them, you had to go to arbitration. Um, that's uncontroversial. Then they amended it once they kind of ran into issues where People uh, had their accounts deleted and stuff. A lot of this runs on political lines uh, that you had to communicate with them uh, before you filed for arbitration. And then once they had a canceled creator direct 72 of his fans to bring them to arbitration, they then changed it again uh, after the fact. Uh, this basically led a judge uh, last week to say that uh, Patreon had overstepped their boundaries and uh, that their TOS is in violation of the, of the law. And now Patreon needs to pay out for all of these cases that were brought. So we, we what we don't know from here is uh, exactly where the financial burden is ultimately going to lay upon Patreon and whether or not beyond uh, them being a little bit more consistent with their terms of service, because I don't think there's any question that they got way too fast and loose with that. Um, which is can a Silicon just, Valley trend. Add, can you just add that the, the, the issue is that it, for every arbitration case, they have to put down like a $2,000 deposit or whatever for every yeah. case that gets open against them. They have to put down a $2,000, which is fine. The problem is, is let's say, you know, you have five, you have five, you're, you have 5,000 people who are supporters of you. And all of a sudden you get your Patreon canceled. If all 5,000 of your fans say, yeah, I want to sue Patreon and I have to go to arbitration. Patreon has to put down $2,000 per claimant, which all of a sudden yeah. that became a $10 million bounty or $10 million that Patreon has to pay out, you know, before the arbitration is settled. And that's the, that's the thing that has people concerned or worried. Is it like, you know, they've, if somebody wanted to have a bunch of people open up these arbitration suits because they canceled somebody and that's, that's kind of a, the, one of the big issues here now. So yeah. how, how could they have dodged this? Uh, uh, because I, I, I do agree. Everything I've, I've seen and heard would indicate that, um, uh, th that they've been sloppy in their decisions about who to pull the plug in and, and, uh, and, and looking the other way on some accounts that probably should have the, the plug pulled on them. Um, is, I mean, is there, there's no safe Harbor because they're picking winners and losers and they're making no bones about it, about who can and can't be on their platform. Um, what, 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 what should they have done and what could they have done? That's the big legal question that the, 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 you use arbitration because it's a much easier, more way to do it. And it can tend to be, you know, more favor the companies in some cases, but there's good arguments. that arbitration is overall probably the, the best way to say handle stuff. Arbitration is usually pretty good when you're not dealing with 
uh, if you're dealing with individual cases and stuff where you're never going to worry about a group of actions together, it's fine. Where if you're not in arbitration, you could, as Patreon, could say, no, we're going to group them all together because it's the same claim. Arbitration, you don't get to do that. They can't group all thousand people trying to sue them under the same under the same reason together. That's the problem. When you're dealing with a one to many, because the relationship is between Patreon, the people who are creating content, and then their fans. And if you take out that person supporting it, the fans then can say, we have an action against Patreon, which I think was... I don't think they predicted that. I don't think their no. legal team realized this was this was. Oh, this is a scenario that could happen. So, so what is yeah. happening now? Is is there a lawsuit happening or uh... now? Right now, in our story, Patreon is on the hook for like ten million dollars for these cases that they lost all at the same time because their TOS was ruled against the law. Uh, so, what we don't know is again how this financially affects Patreon. Do they got to go get more funding? Like, is this something they can absorb? Does this lead uh, to other action, other similar action coming forward? Uh, we, we don't know. What I do know is I downloaded all of my emails from Patreon <laughs> immediately upon hearing this, and I will continue to regularly download all the emails that I have on Patreon, and I have I have set up other uh, other, hey, Bryce, other crowdfunding make a note, things uh, on the night attack, night attack account and cord kills. We're just just for fun, let's download all of our emails. It's just good hygiene. I would just rec as people who make their living on Patreon. It's it's regularly good hygiene just to download those emails so you have those emails just in case. Yeah. Ugh, it's man, like yeah, ugh, it's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, uh, I've said then, now, and forever with Patreon, and uh, again, I owe my living to Patreon. Patreon created a brand that connected with my community that allowed me to get paid, and I've and and guess what? It's endured where a lot of other institutions have not endured in our uncertain economic times. And for that, I will be eternally grateful. And all I've ever wanted for them is to just act like a grown ass bank. Also like a boring, like bunch of like ironclad, uh, legal TOS people bank. Like you don't need to be the fun, flashy, cool for kids uh, 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 awesome brand at this point there's so much money that and and you've created you've congratulations you won the goal was make art something that you could crowdfund on a regular sustainable basis you did it and i'm here to ask you please for god's sakes start acting more boring and less cavalier also everybody uh, grab a pen and pencil and just jot this down pen and uh, pencil you might have to just, <laughs> just write it on your hands <laughs> right with two with, with both hands that's right well, I got uh, this. just get ready mm -hmm. if you want to support the weird things podcast then make sure to write those checks to p.o box 6006 yeah. poughkeepsie falls idaho <laughs> 90036 keep an eye out for our coffee account um, but yeah, it's yeah. and it's so interesting because like Patreon has like stood, uh, uh, managed to stand against other competitive other competing services that have come and go, right? Like even ones that were there before it. I mean, they obviously hit on something sure. that allowed them to to, to swoop I mean, in. Think of the largest of Kickstarter and their drip service went almost nowhere very very fast um and, and, and did, didn't uh, uh hank green had a company something star supporter or something weird mm -hmm. like that uh, and that, that predated uh patreon as well and yeah. just patreon was the, the 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 right things at the right time um but boy am i with you justin it's like uh uh, uh when uh you know how youtube is has, has skirted a lot of stuff uh is uh uh, a safe harbor because like, Hey man, we don't, we, we ain't picking sides on this. I mean, uh, is it copyright? Is it pornography? We're done. Uh, go ahead. I, I, yeah, I, I think that, look, there's a lot, there's some chickens coming home to roost on the idea of deplatforming and where you're allowed to post stuff and where you're not allowed to post stuff. Uh, this is a part of that conversation. And, uh, I, again, all, all I want is just, 50 lawyers looking at exactly what the rules are and have those rules 
be what they are. Uh, uh, and, and I, this, like the way that if you go into this story and you see like just how capriciously Patreon was changing their TOS as they were getting sued to protect against, or these cases were being brought to arbitration, like at, it, it was just irresponsible. It was irresponsible of them. So support and the show. Weird things at OnlyFans. Mm. <laughs> I won't even give Careful. The... That might be a thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Actually, yeah. There. <laughs> I, I didn't give the top level domain. Dot pizza. There we go. Yeah. yeah I mean, Look, I, 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 I. Email address? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They've. Yeah. We all. We all. I think we all fans of what Patreon's done. I mean, that's clear. We, we love what they've done. And there is that, that point where you start off with an idea you get momentum for it and then you sit back and you have to say, what are we? And then there's what the company wants it to be. And then there's what the customers want it to be. And I think that's, that might be where the disconnect is. Cause we've seen, you know, you've got, we've seen a lot with the Patreon. We're trying, this is what we're pushing for and stuff. And things that surprised me too, is, you know, Patreon saying they didn't make much money on people who are doing like $40 or $50 a month, Patreon campaigns. And to me, that was insane because your overhead, I mean, like, I, I get, like, you can restructure how you do credit card processing and stuff. That seemed crazy to me that, like, you could, should be able to build an empire on 40 or $50 a month, people. But, you know, they're, I think they thought of, you know, maybe they wanted to be more, focused more on the higher volume, higher quality brands, which then means algorithms or it means selection and losers and stuff. And, and I think that's where we got to the problem. Yeah. But we're fans. <sighs> I mean, no, I'm, 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 we're, we're only, I'm dependent. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> financially tied to this platform. Uh, if, if, uh, you know, you start thinking for me of worst case scenarios among the worst case scenarios is either Patreon suffers such reputational damage that people flee despite the fact that which, they want to continue which, giving me which, money we've already been through down. once we've uh, the, uh, the first time they started deplatforming large um you know uh, for whether it's justified or not uh large scale people all of a sudden there was a stink on it and fans of of the people who are deplatformed are suddenly writing us and saying i love your content but i cannot in good conscience support whatever so because i'm also a lazy fan i'm out <laughs> And then it's like, yeah. well, that's money that vanished. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, an adult. I just want adults. I want John Q adult. And he has like a high and tight haircut and he wears wingtips to bed. Like that's how adult he is. And he's just got a leather suitcase to be the one who runs Patreon and he drinks milk four times a day like that's <laughs> a lot of milk i dude this guy is such an adult that it's dude has the stinkiest too it's like <laughs> oh i want i want him like he just brings his own liverwurst and his his <laughs> trad wife makes for him and like it's like like you're like describing like Kyle McLaughlin from Twin Peaks here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's who we need. <laughs> we I need just, some damn fine Patreon. That's what we I need. Just, John businessman, <laughs> adult from the adult family. John like, businessman and adult. Yeah, I. That's who I just. I God for. Like anytime, like I want him just to come in and just ban long hair from the office, <laughs> like and just like like nobody can play a video game. Like it just, I want it the most boring gray place to work because my money is very tied to your company and i don't want i don't want anybody just like hey bro what do we update the tos lol 14 I, emojis in slack enough no. i once went i once went to a one of these startup presentations and it was in his like the one of these big shared co-location spaces whatever and People were getting up and pitching their startups, and they were under the idea that there were actually the people there that were going to fund them and not like, you know, 200 other people looking for funding. Um, and you'd see these presentations where people felt like they were giving like their tech crunch or their TED talk, whatever. They go up on stage and they're just sort of this lukewarm reaction. The best one was a guy goes up on stage and he's like, you could tell like he wanted to have music played or had some sort of like music played, but it was just on a little stereo speaker. It felt like a Michael Scott kind of moment. And he had, he had a man purse. He's wearing like this sort of not quite tie dye, but the very sort of kind of hippie thing. He had this man purse and he was pitching his new currency. 
yet a new currency says money sucks is why you need to move to this thing and whatever and i'm like wavy gravy i don't think we want to invest in your financial startup you know that you had you know between bong hits and it was just that what instills confidence if he had a three-piece suit on same guy cut whatever and was boring i'd be tell me more but this guy that looks like you know he's trying to figure out you know how to sell decals out of a truck at a fish concert and he, he, and he just kept him. shouting, developers, developers, developers. <laughs> it was the weirdest presentation. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Mean, His look, name was hey, John Bitcoin. <laughs> John yeah. Bitcoin. I mean, but with, uh, a y, uh, with a Y. With a Y. <laughs> with a y. Yeah. But not what you would think. Not what you would think. <laughs> oh, man, I think we got to call it. Uh, uh, man, that's fascinating. Um, yeah. oof. Keep an eye out for TikTok. Yeah. Download those emails, kids. Download those emails. <laughs> it's a one button. So. It's a little CSV. Boop. Just put it in your drive. What are our picks? Uh, oh, I watched uh, Eurovision Song Contest, the Fire Saga uh, with uh, uh, Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams. Uh, just a charming little movie. I, I, you know, there, there's definitely a. Um, Gary Sanchez, that is uh, Will Ferrell and Adam McKay's uh, production company. There's a certain playbook that they have, um, but uh, this was the music was on point, and that carries it. Uh, and and Rachel McAdams was just uh, just fantastic. She really is the star of the show. How how unfair is it that Pierce Brosnan gets to be this handsome? By the way, this at, that age? at this age. Shit. That dude hasn't a. I mean, like, he's one of those people that, like, from when I was a kid and he was James Bond and in uh, uh, Mrs. Doubtfire, like, he just stopped dyeing his beard. That's, like, the only thing that's functionally changed about Pierce Brosnan. Yeah, I, it's when she's like, man, I'd, I'd give my, my remaining lives, life to look like him. <laughs> you know, I'll take, I'd be Pierce Brosnan. It's 67 instead of me now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, got a, I got a quick pick. Uh, uh, Last Chance to You is back on Netflix. They got a new school this time. It's uh, This is the show that follows junior college football teams. Uh, this time they're following Laney Junior College uh, in Oakland. It's literally right across the lake. You oh, can no see kidding. it from my you can see it from my building. Oh, that's great. Um I'm only I'm only like one episode into it, but uh I'm I always dig Last Chance You and I think them only doing two seasons at a at any given school makes a lot of sense because the second season they always are so aware that they're on camera, they're so aware of how they've been seen. Um and they the, those teams end up doing really bad on the second years, so I'll tell you that. Uh, last chance to see this on Netflix, season five. Uh, hey, so if I say the words, I, I like some fantasy novel series, um, uh, some people, it's a bit like saying you're, you're into anime. Like, like there's a lot of bad anime and there's a lot of bad fantasy novel series. Um, there are some good ones too, like really standout good ones. Uh, I love the King Killer Chron Chronicles, Name of the Wind. I love uh, the Gentleman Bastard series, starting with the, L the Lies of Locke Lamora. And every time I mention those two, everybody, including my daughter, starts badgering me to uh, 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 start reading the Mistborn series, uh, which, I, which I finally just started. And um, I'm about, uh, I don't know, a third of the way into the first book. And uh, they, have a, uh, 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 they have a cool magic system. And, and it's, it's always fun when it's, it's, like, it's like buying into a new role-playing game where it's like you got to learn a new combat system or whatever. And, uh, but I like, uh, I like I'm, I'm picking up what they're putting down. And uh, it's, it's, it's a yeah. dark and strange world. Brandon Sanderson is the guy's name. He is he's quite prolific. I was having a conversation with the other day, though, about like there's like this weird Venn diagram of like fantasy novels and then gamers. And like, well, I like the magic system in this fantasy novel, you know, where yeah. you're like, oh, yeah. that's a very it was such was so weird to me. And then I'm like, oh, I get it. If I was a gamer, they're like, oh, I like the way this magic works. You know? mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, well, it's it, it is sort of a game. It's a it's a fun game of like, you know, as you as as combat unfolds. You know, you as the reader are trying to think of of okay, what moves do you have, or what can be done here, or so on, and then and then the you know protagonist or bad guy or whatever surprises you with a combination you didn't expect, and and it's 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 a bit like watching somebody play a video game, and you're like, oh, I didn't see that coming. Nice. Yeah, kind of like like 
two books that were neat to sort of read together. One was you know Player of Games. Oh yeah, which we've talked about. Yeah, that's uh, great. You know the Ian Banks, which is just like a great. It's Casino Royale, and you know a post singularity sort of thing. Casino Royale. Uh, Ian Fleming is a very different sort of James Bond story because it, most of it, it takes place around this high stakes card game and trying to basically bankrupt a terrorist, you know, and this time in the original one, like a, you know, guy was an operative for Smirsh. And it's such a neat thing to say a spy thing based upon the rules of this game being played and all the things going around it. And I could see like with a magic system and stuff, like these are the rules. Now we're going to see how they work in ways you don't think about. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Andrew, did you have a pick? My pick is, I've been listening to this, I read it years ago, Insanely Great by Stephen Levy, who is an author of a number of books, most recently a book about Facebook, but this is Insanely Great, which was a book written like 1994 or whatever about the development of the Macintosh. And he goes into the early history. A lot of people, a lot of people know some of the history. They're like, oh, well, they got stuff from Xerox Park. And it's like, yeah, and Xerox Park brought people from S Stanford Research Institute and just sort of the evolution of that platform and something that's written in the point of view from like 1994, 95 is kind of interesting where the really interesting stuff is about to happen, but uh, very neat. And he uses a very neat example and they're talking about how some of these early innovators of graphical user interfaces and the mouse, people like Alan Kay and Doug Engelbart, he talks about the idea, some people are Da Vinci's and some people are Michelangelo's. Da Vinci had a lot of ideas, a lot of unfinished ideas, an idea for this, an idea for that, and was prolific. And da Vinci had thoughts about everything. Da Vinci's actual works, if you act, ask somebody to point to a work by Da Vinci, of course, there's the Mona Lisa and some other paintings. But other than that, there's harder to find those examples. But if you say Michelangelo, you could think of maybe, you know, what the most prominent is the Sistine Chapel, the thing that's still there to this day. And this was a thing that took years, a good por portion of his lifetime to create. Some people move from idea to idea and don't see them through. Other people sit down and see a thing through execution. And I thought that was a very interesting way because we often say, oh, I'm a creative type. Well, there's different kinds of creative types. There's the have a bunch of ideas, wait for something to stick, or maybe, and maybe have a kind of a brilliance about a thing. And then there's, I'm going to see this thing happen. I'm going to make this thing happen if it takes years to make it happen. And there's no right or wrong way, but I think it's a different, a helpful distinction to see there. And that's the part of the early, you know, the computer, you know, innovators was they had a lot of ideas but nobody part of it was just the timing but we just did, were able to follow something all the way through he goes to talk to uh i think it's doug engelbart who was a guy that came up with so much of what we used for like the mouse the way we things interact and everything else in computer systems he goes to interview him in like uh the mid 80s or whatever you know after the mac is there whatever and he's working for some or but right before that he's working for some like phone company thing that bought another division or something like this, and he's in a cubicle. And this guy's one of the most brilliant pioneers of the computer age, but people just didn't recognize the potential for it. And, you know, he's just got a little job here doing this. So, wow. Hmm. Wow. very interesting. Pretty cool. Gentlemen, it's been after. Hey, there we go. All awesome. right. Good stuff, everybody. Uh, we're going to... Uh, turn around. The guys will be doing happy hour here in yeah. yep. about 30 minutes. Come back with Cord Killers. Have a good time on Cord Killers. And uh, and yeah, that'll be it for this. my hat. Oh, Shark Week. Yeah. Munch. They sent me, I, I got a, there was a big box on my doorstep and I opened it up and they sent me two huge Shark Week beach chairs Ooh. and then like hats and so I'm like, oh, cool. They remember me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, boys. Very cool. See you. All right, everyone. Have a good rest of your Monday. Thank you.